Chapter 3, Bad Nana Lends a Hand. The whole thing started when Bad Nana let down her card on Mr Pinnock's mobility scooter and everyone agreed she had gone too far. It didn't matter that Mr Pinnock had been rude to Bad Nana's best friend since in the queue at the post office. It was no excuse. The next morning, while having a cuppa with Simp, Bad Nana decided she was done with mischief and she would turn over a new leaf. Simp and I rolled our eyes at each other. We'd heard it all before. But what we hadn't heard before was that this new leaf meant Bad Nana would be volunteering to do good things for others. But this was a completely new leaf altogether. I was confused. I stopped being confused and started being a bit fed up when Bad Nana told me her first good thing for others involved her helping to the region at my school. I have enough trouble with George and her fa fa ha ha sneaking about the place waiting for me to do something enormously embarrassing or just a bit silly and then teasing me about it forever. Sometimes I don't even know I've, I've done anything out of the ordinary, but Georgina does. And then she makes sure everyone else does too. So having Bad Nana around at school the whole time was sure to result in me getting a horrible new nickname. And I was just getting comfortable with Odd Socks Genie. I know it's a ridiculous nickname. Even more ridiculous when you consider my socks weren't even odd. One had just fallen down. So I felt ginormously better when it turned out that Bad Nana was doing good in Jack's class and helping with reading on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Once everyone had got the hang of lowering Bad Nana into the tiny chairs outside Cherry Class, she really seemed to be doing a very excellent job of being reading helper. It was all going really well and Bad Nana was doing lots of good things, helping Jack and the class read better. They all seemed to really enjoy reading and Bad Nana and their vocabulary was with Bad Nana and their vocabulary was growing in all kinds of new and interesting ways. Things only got into a bit of a pickle when Jack's best friend, Ollie, came back from his term reading with Bad Nana and told the class he was a proper diamond geezer. Diamond geezer sort of means good man, but a bit more illegal and dodgier. And then asked Miss Peabody what it meant. This made Miss Peabody go a greenish type of colour and rush out of the room to the reading corner. It turned out that Bad Nana had been getting Cherry Class to read her library books and she just started a particularly good true crime thriller which Ollie had been reading. Miss Peabody tried to explain that this was not entirely appropriate and Bad Nana said she didn't see why as they were much more exciting than the hop and fluff books they had loved and they had lots of new words for the children to learn, and that she was saving a fortune on library fines, and as they were all based on real life events, it was a bit, of, a bit like history too. But Miss Peabody was quite sure about not wanting five-year-olds to read true crime stories, so Bad Nana stopped being Cherry Class's reading helper. Jack was quite sad about this, but I was completely relieved, as I found having Bad Nana in school on not only Tuesdays, but Thursdays as well was far too nerve-wracking. I was not relieved for long. In fact, quite soon I was totally unrelieved as Bad Nana happily told me she had volunteered to be a helper on my school trip to the local history museum, aka the most boring place ever. I was so unrelieved I fell over. Actually, for real. Somehow Miss Peabody hadn't reported Bad Nana to the school reception after the reading incident, so she was still in the clear to be a school trip helper. I felt this was very sloppy secure, school security, but as it was too late to do anything, I tried to look on the bright side. Bad Nana could be lots of fun. She always had lemon sherbets, which were very handy for coach journeys. And if I was in her, her group, but, but uh, and if I was in her group, but Georgina Far Far Ha Ha wasn't, then it might not be a complete, total, one hundred percent disaster. Maybe. On the day of the school trip, I woke all, all up sixes and sevens. The butterflies in my tummy had great big boots on and I could barely manage my second bowl of cocoa puffs. Please, can Bad Nana behave herself? I said to no one in particular and tried really, really hard not to imagine all the absolutely embarrassing things she could do. Well, even I hadn't bargained with Bad Nana trying to get a sing song going on the bus. But thankfully, we were all far too miserable for that. Normally, on school trips, we are all giddy with excitement for a whole day out of school. Mr. Holmwood usually has to tell us, calm it down, or we will peak too early, and we never believe
season, which is so silly because we all rode right. But today, everyone except for Banana was pretty quiet on the bus because we had all been here before. Literally, we had all been to the local history museum before in year one. So we knew what a completely happy, zappy day of boredom lay ahead. I would like to point out that I normally really like museums. They are full of interesting facts that are actually interesting, sometimes even head-poppingly interesting. Plus they have levers and pulleys and buttons and gift shops with fancy pencils. But the main fact you learn at the local history museum is that we do not have a lot of lo history, history locally. I could overlook that though if it wasn't for the, man, for the man who works at the local history museum. He seems to love the museum but hates anyone who visits, which is very confusing. He is even cross with the lady in the sweet shop and she is livid. This is a mystery to me as how could you even be slightly pleased if you worked in a sweet shop all day long? Mum says it's too much sugar. We arrived at the museum and all flocked off the coach. Mr Holman didn't have to be to say be quiet once, not even to Emily Bartlett, and she's always talking. Mr Holmwood looked a bit worried, then bad man started tutting and eyeballing all at once. I thought she might be having one of her funny turns, and reached for her bag to get her, her an emergency lemon sherbet. But as she swung the bag away, and jabbed her bony finger at the museum sign, I realised she was not having a turn at all, but was in fact not at all happy. It turns out Bad Nana thought we were visiting the local mystery museum, which doesn't even exist as far as I know. Anyway, Bad Nana loves a mystery. Her favourite programme is Cozy Billy's Murders, and we are always on the lookout for something suspicious. So you can imagine how completely disappointed she was especially with the local history museum. Not only being the bo most boring museum ever, but having nothing mysterious about it at all. It was a double blow and Bad Nana did not look like she was taking it at all well. Mr Holmwood put us all into groups and mine was mainly William. It had Mar Marcy and Wilf in it. Suki was in another group but she was with her mum and Penny heard, so she didn't really, really mind. Susie Stubbs and Claire Coleman were in our group and they are sort of friends with Georgia but also sort of not. I think they are mainly scared of her and I don't think that is really a good thing for a friendship. So I wasn't too worried about Bad Nana doing something double embarrassing. We also had Lydia in our group. Now I like Lydia. She is really good at reading and can be quite funny but she mostly walks on tiptoes so it takes ages to get anywhere. Which is no good for a school trip. I started to feel a bit panicky that we wouldn't get anything done, even before Mr Holmwood had handed out the clipboards and worksheets. We all lined up under the sign, the local history museum reading local history for life, which was quite funny because it didn't feel very lively at all. The furious museum man was already furious with us all for all the things he was sure we were going to do once we got into the museum. E.g. touching things, or running about, or talking, or laughing, or breathing, or anything that wasn't standing still and looking listening. We all dropped drooped into the museum like a line of sad zombies. Someone who didn't know us might have thought we were extremely well behaved, but really we were just sad and bored in advance. Lydia tripped up the steps which I imagine must have been really tricky to navigate on tiptoes, and straight away the furious museum man barked at her then gave her such a stinky look that she went all red and her eyes went a bit watery. Wilf and I held her hand, hoping it would help. I think it did. Bad Nana fixed the furious museum man with her good beady eye and I knew she wasn't going to be taking much more of this nonsense. The museum tour began and the furious museum man suddenly started talking like an angry robot which after 10 minutes sort of makes you sleepy and nervous all at the same time. After a bit, Freddie made a yipping noise as he'd fallen asleep standing up and ha was having a dream he was a small dog. The furious museum man shouted Freddie awake, which although startling was actually a good thing as Freddie was dreaming he was being chased by a big dog, hence the yipping. The furious museum man then shouted at Freddie, just 
how he was supposed to bring the history to life and visitors kept falling asleep. We all considered this for a while and Freddie even started to answer it. Something about making it more interesting. But Mr Holman stepped in and said that we could talk about that later. I got the impression it was one of those questions grown-ups ask but they don't actually want an answer for. During the next long lecture, the furious museum man shouted at Georgina for sneezing. Tim for coughing, Sally for hiccuping, but she stood all for as Sally said she got, only got the hiccups because the furious museum man made her so nervous. And Suki's mum for fidgeting. Then he made a huge shouting mistake by yelling at Bad Nana for sucking too loudly on a lemon sherbet, and even suggested she has surely had enough lemon sherbet already. Well, that was it. Bad, Bad Nana's good beady eye narrowed and she went a very bright shade of purpley red, which I'd never seen her go before. I mean, I have seen her go pink, I've seen her go reddish, even red, but I've never seen her go the purpley red and I could only imagine this was not a good thing. Finally, the lecture stopped and we were given worksheets. Mr Holmwood looked confused when we all grabbed them happily. That had never happened before. Anything was better than listening to the furious museum man talking about the almost non-existent local history in his angry robot voice. As I took my clipboard from Mr Holmwood, Georgina gave me one of those I'm watching you off socks looks and I tried to make sure I was being completely normal and in no way doing anything that looked odd or different or teasable. I was concentrating so hard on this that I accidentally walked into a stand with a reproduction guys that the furious museum man thought might have been a bit like the one they had in the museum a million years ago when it was actually a hag. The vase wibbled, then it wobbled and it wibbled a bit more and then it fell down. The furious museum man dived and tried to catch the vase, but he was miles away and actually it just looked like he fell over all of a sudden. But Billy caught it instead as he was right there and an excellent goalkeeper on our school football team. Phew, I thought, but then I, I thought again as the furious museum man got up, dusted himself down and then stared, started yelling at me so super duper loudly I couldn't make, quite make out what he was saying. It all just blurred into one long, foghorn type noise. But I did get the impression that was what he was saying wouldn't be at all. I'm not sure how long this would have gone on for had Bad Nana not inserted herself between me and the furious museum man and told him in no uncertain terms that accidents happen. There was no harm done and that was quite enough of that. The furious museum man gave Bad Nana a funny look like he just swallowed some super hot chilli sauce. But Bad Nana didn't even blink and off he stumped. I felt a little bit wobbly, like I'd been in a, riot, in a wind tunnel turned to max, but Bad Nana snuck each of us a lemon sherbet for medicinal purposes, and we were off. Everyone was bobbing about trying to be the first group to finish. It turned out Lydia had gone quite fast on her tiptoe, what with mainly walking on me and everything. So we were doing really well until... We were all shuffling past the pretend old bedroom in a sort of sad conga line. There were fancy ropes that stopped us actually going into the pretend old bedroom, which are quite a bit fancier than the actual bedroom. If I'm really honest, Georgina was in, right in front of us and telling boring the rest of her group about her upcoming dance showcase with visitors. The dance group she belongs to. I'm not sure it was strictly dancing, as it looked more like electric shocks and flinging himself about the place to me. But I have to say, the whole the way they make their hair stand, stay straight up and not move one inch, no matter how much they fling themselves and jump about, is actually very impressive. Anyway, Georgina was explaining a particularly tricky part of their disco routine, and no one knew, cared, what she was on about. So with her hair flip, her eye roll, combo, that's quite clearly said we were all idiots, she demonstrated to me. It was really extremely energetic and so super fast, I couldn't tell you exactly which body part she moved. But what I do know is that the body part hit Lydia, whose balance was already off. What with her being on tiptoes, so she went flying with such disco force that the red ropes didn't 
suffer going into the pretend old bedroom at all. All I heard was a blump, and a cloud of dust blew up from the bed, and all we could see were Lydia's toes still pointed and hanging over the end of the pretend old bed. We were all stood super still like musical statues, professionals. Then Mr Holmwood rushed forward to rescue Lydia from the dust, which was settling back down all over her. We needn't have bothered being the furious man's belly rump. Unsettled the dust all over again. To say he was furious was like saying I only like egg sandwiches when I actually love egg sandwiches. Even if I can only eat them in the safety of my own home now. He was now definitely infinity in furious. Even Mr. Holmwood looked paler than usual as he stood behind Lydia while the furious man shouted at her. But then that could have been the dust. Lydia had gone all red again and her eyes were watery too. And it was also super unfair because it wasn't even her fault. But the real culprit, disco dancing Georgina, had shimmied away when the yelling started. When I looked at Bad Nana, I could see she was that purple red colour again and I could hardly even see her good beady eye. It was so narrow. Lunchtime should have been more fun what with comparing packed lunches, swapping snacks and eating on the grass, but it wasn't. Lydia's eyes were still watery and this wasn't helped by Georgina making snoring noises and asking her if it was bedtime as she slumped by with her group. I knew Georgina was a total meaner, but I don't expect her to cause a complete catastrophe not even own up, and then tease the person she'd inflicted the complete catastrophe upon. This was a new low, even for her. We slowly and bravely ate our sandwiches, crisp biscuits and healthy fruit snacks as Bad Nana pointed out we would need our strength for the rest of the vigil. We all nodded sadly. After lunch, we gathered in the great hall. It wasn't great, but it was a hall. And the furious museum man yells at us about how ages ago some posh people would have dinner in his actual room. Apparently, some people even thought an old man and king had popped by for a feast and eaten loads. That's not exactly how the furious museum man said it, but that's basically what he meant. Then he said we had to draw an olden days feast, just like the one that he had set up in the Great Hall using some slightly frightening looking mannequins, an old wooden table and some dusty posh Papier mache food. I thought it looked a bit like a Christmas at Auntie Sandra's house, minus the paper hats. As we all sat down in total silence and started to draw, the furious museum man marched about and said absolutely nothing nice about anyone's pictures. Then he stopped by Lydia, whose eyes had only just stopped watering, and he looked at her picture. Then for the first time all day, he smiled. I knew he fell straight over. Maybe he wasn't completely furious after all. Maybe he was actually slightly not horrible, maybe. But then his smile turned into a creepy sneer and the creepy sneer turned into a nasty laugh. And then the furious museum man was nasty, nastily laughing and creepily sneering and even evilly pointed at poor Lydia's drawing. If I'm going to be 100% honest, 100 totally honest, drawing it isn't Lydia's best skill. But you can't be good at everything, and she's really good at reading. And anyway, I thought it looked a lot like olden, an olden time feast, sort of. Georgina, who's never one to miss out on a bit of picking on innocent people just minding their own business, hopped over and looked at Lydia's drawing and started nastily laughing too. Which was double annoying, as she was the one who had gotten Lydia into trouble earlier. Then everyone else started to laugh because if Georgina was laughing and she's not laughing at you, then you'd better join in or else. With all the nasty laughing and creepy sneering and evil pointing, it wasn't at all surprising that Lydia's eyes started to water and water and she went all pink and looked very wobbly even though she was sitting down and not even on tiptoes. I looked around for Bad Nana because I knew she wouldn't be having any of this nonsense. But as I turned round, all I could see was her back disappearing behind a curtain. What? Where was she hobbling off to when a group needed her? It was not at all like bad manners to shy away from trouble. I was com completely confused, and all the loud laughing wasn't helping. It was all so unfair, and I just couldn't let Lydia and her tiptoes down. 
And then I realised I had to do something because it really didn't look like anyone else was going to. I stood up and I wriggled around a bit because I wasn't really sure what I was going to do next and my tummy was doing all kinds of gymnastics and I started to say stop but it sounded like more like a squawk because my throat was all tight and I looked at Wilf and he was mouthing, what are you doing? At me. And I mouthed back, I don't know. While shrugging my shoulders for extra emphasis. And then I looked at Lydia with her pink and washy face and I tried again. Stop it! I shouted. This time my throat let the actual words out and everyone but the curious museum man stopped. I think they were all a bit surprised because I'm not really the shouting type. Then I shouted again. Stop it, please! Because manners are still important, even if you are talking to a completely mean, curious museum man. You were just being horrible, and mean, and nasty, and horrible, and... By this point, I realised that he had stopped laughing, and the smiley sneer had been replaced by a curious face, which funny enough looked almost exactly the same as one of the stone gargoyles he had been whittling on about earlier. I was a bit stuck then because my brain decided to stop thinking entirely and I just stood there like a total twit with my mouth hanging open and no idea what to do next. This was quite a worry as I could feel the curious museum man was about to say something and I felt very strongly that what he was going to say was not going to work out too well for me. Young lady, he boomed. And although this was a promising start, and not totally insulting, I was very sure it was going to get worse. When you are in my museum, the local history museum, bring your local history to life, I think you will find that I can do just about whatever I please, and furthermore, well, we never did get any further or hear any more, because just then, just a dusty papier mache chicken drumstick hit the curious museum man on the side of his head. Then a dusty papier mache apple came flying over and missed him and got Georgina on the forehead. We all turned around to see where these things were coming from and saw that history had actually really truly come to life. Amazingly, the round king in the display was chuckling away merrily and hurling all kinds of papier mache food about, but mainly in the direction of the furious museum man who was now more furious than ever. But hardly anyone really noticed as they were all dancing around in front of the display, enjoying local history being brought to life by the round chuckling king. Everyone started asking the round king lots of questions because it's not very often you can quiz a 16th century king, chuckling or not. I wanted to ask the round king why all of a sudden he was wearing ginormous glasses and earrings that gave him a little bit of twinkle but I decided not to as everyone was enjoying themselves too much. I'm not sure all the answers the round king gave were strictly correct and Mr. Holmwood had to help him out with a few. But all in all, I think everyone got something out of it, even the furious museum man, because he got the subs big time. When it was time to go and we were all lining up, the sulking museum man announced very loudly that our school we will no longer be welcome at the local history museum. No longer bringing history to life because we clearly didn't appreciate our local history. And I thought that was odd because after the Round King came to life, it seemed like absolutely everyone in my class appreciated history quite a lot, except for Brian Hardwick, but then he was only just interested in outer space and wine guns. I thought I saw this whole Mr. Holm would do a little smile when he touched it and maybe high-five the coach driver, but I might have been mistaken. I wasn't. Bad Nana came tottering up to the coach at quite a pace for her. She was all out of breath and looked rather warm, which might have had something to do with the red beard she was sporting. Wilf and Lydia and Susie and Claire all ran up to her, yelping about everything that, she, that had just happened and asking where she was. And wasn't it a shame she missed all the fun? Very hilariously, they didn't seem to notice the beard at all, which I thought spoke very poorly of their image of Bad Nana. We were all in total fits about the chuckling round king and the flying paper mache food and Georgina's apple in the face and the furious museum man's sauce. 
On the bus on the way home, after I had signaled to Brad Mama to remove her beard, I thought about all the future classes who would no longer have to visit the local history museum, definitely not bringing history to life, and how I had played a small part in that, and how Brad Mama had played a big part in that, and how Georgina was now calling me Jeannie Power Pants on account of my school, which just goes to show three things. One, Georgina will give me super rubbish nicknames no matter what I do, so I really can't be worried about all, about all that. Well, not too much anyway. And two, there was a small chance that I would be regarded as a tiny bit of a hero by future pupils at my school who will not have to visit the most boring and furious museum in the world ever. Maybe there would even be a plaque in my honour. And three, that while no... While Bad Mama may have been a little bit naughty and maybe even a tiny bit embarrassing, she is mainly brilliant. The end.